Push your hats down now. All right, you guys hear us now? But of course, it's uh, there's going to be a bit of delay until this happens. Yeah, sound should be back on now. Let me see. Okay. Not exactly sure how long the delay is. I think it's a fair bit. I'm going to pop this chat out so we can see better. Okay, cool. It's working. It's audio is back on. I hope the audio is okay, and hope the I hope the uh, live stream uh, bandwidth is sufficient because we actually don't have um, a hard line here for internet. We're just using our phones because this is an apartment that we don't really use. This is an apartment that um, is kind of Marlene's family's. Her parents own it. They're only here part time. So we just have the bare essentials as far as utilities go. Electric, water, no gas or anything. No, no there's no gas in the city yet. So. But it's making our lives easier with, there's running water, there's hot showers. Yeah. So if we, when we can go outside and come back, we can wash our clothes, we can shower and feel better about having the virus outside with those yeah. with those things versus in the van we come back we're dirty we have no hot shower we have no laundry it's, it's uh i think a lot of it just has to do with the zone that we have that we can feel safe in so pre prior to us coming back here our zone was in the van uh during the whole lock lockdown during the whole self-isolation uh it was it's it's fine for us, like we don't, we, we really enjoy living in a small van and as long as we can also have access to the outside. And as soon as that outside access became unsuitable, um, we lost the ability to kind of expand our space. So, you know, we can deal with being inside the van during bad weather and stuff, like for multiple days in a row. But just, we didn't see any end in sight, you know, I mean, Obviously, still right now, for most people in the world, like all the lockdown, all the lockdowns keep getting extended. So, if the lockdown was going to end for sure at a certain date, even while we're in Morocco, yeah. we would have stayed in Morocco. But we can see yeah. that it's going to keep getting pushed and pushed and pushed. Then, because what we knew, what we knew at the beginning was that okay, there's going to be a lockdown. And let's just see how other countries are handling it. If we can see a good example of how somebody's handling the lockdown and then places can kind of replicate that, then, okay, then we can kind of see an idea. So, okay, maybe two weeks or three weeks or four weeks. Even if it's four weeks, five weeks, six weeks, as long as we had the expectation that after six weeks, we can continue exploring like we had planned to do. We, were plan to, we plan to be in Morocco for our full 90 days. And we ended up only being there for about 50, 40 to 50 days. Mm -hmm. So we were only about halfway through our time there. So we knew that the um, the 90 day thing was likely going to be extended. Like I knew that the government of Morocco wasn't going to enforce people that are stuck there for longer. But what we knew was that the way that we were going to travel, the way, the way that we had wanted to travel was not going to be the same. It was not going to be available to us for the foreseeable future. So really what we looked at each other and thought, like, what should we do? It made no sense to wait there and be stuck in one place. And then when we're able to come back here. So let's, let's just try to come back here if that opportunity was there. So the, lo the window of the opportunity was open. But it closed really quickly. So yeah, we're we're back here now. You know, we have friends that are still stuck there. They uh, they're either unable to afford the ferry ticket to come back if the ferry's still running. I don't know if there's. I haven't kept up with the news to see if there's more ferries going. Uh, I knew that there was a ferry three days ago. Um, so those people are now in Europe on their way home, wherever they are. So I hope. You know, 
all those trips that people have taken from that ferry are going well. But we just realized that, yeah, if, if we're going to be in one place, this was going to be a much bigger safe zone for us. Yeah. Like, we feel like, you know, even though this is a relatively small two-bedroom apartment compared to, you know, American standards, where we're from originally, and even in European standards, this is a relatively small apartment, but it's big for somebody who's used to living in a van. So, yeah, so let's see. Yeah, Hello from we... Montreal. When are we coming back to the U.S.? Um, basically, for the time being, we when, when we got here a little, little less than two years ago, at the beginning, our mindset was like, oh, we're just going to go travel Europe. You know, we have the opportunity. Marlene and the kids have dual citizenship. I can get residency here. So we're just going to go travel Europe for a little while. But after a little over a year, what we realized, it's like, we're not just here on a trip. We've, in the meantime, for the time being, moved here to Europe. Because we don't necessarily have an end date in sight. So we don't know when we're going to go back to the Europe or U.S. Uh, we will go back to the U.S., obviously, uh, at some point. Um, one reason is that our car has not been permanently imported to Europe, so the car cannot stay here forever. But the car can stay here as long as we continue to travel. Basically, every 180 days, we have to leave the European Union. Mm -hmm. And then after we leave, then driving back in, re-imports it for another 180 days. So that's what we're doing for now. But if it means that we're not going to be able to travel, then yeah, that's going to be a problem. Then we may have to ship the car back. So, but at least for now, the car just entered the European Union when we came back from Morocco to France. So, right. you know, we're at 176 days or something of our 180 day. So. Now, a lot of countries are extending, like in Croatia, if you're here and you're, yeah. your permit or your driver's license or something about your car has expired, they're waiving all late fees or problems yeah. and actually adding an extra 30 days on top of it right so you have 30 there's leniency days, 30 days once things are back to normal plus 30 days so hopefully a lot of countries will do that yeah we don't and have to i worry think about our van being here croatia doing it is probably more of like a european union policy because we actually know people that are stuck in croatia mm -hmm. they're down south and near uh dubrovnik so you know it's it's not a bad place to be stuck and the way that we imagine Croatia being this summer, there's going to be a lot of businesses that are going to be hurt because Croatia is heavily based on tourism, like a lot of countries in, uh, in Eastern Europe, especially along the coast, like Greece, too. I think that's going to be a problem for them, too. Um, even the non-European Union countries, Montenegro, Albania, they rely heavily on tourism. But just selfishly, we're excited for once all this blows past, maybe in a month, maybe in two months, when summer rolls around, it's going to be a, a very uncrowded. Like, it hasn't been like this for probably 30 years. So, we're going to do our part to try to, you know, invigorate the <laughs> tourism business. If we but, can. Um, but are we in Croatia? Yes, we're in Croatia right now. Um, don't you think it was best to stay in Morocco until the crisis end? Morocco, Morocco's handling the problem much better than Europe or U.S.? Like we said earlier, yeah. the reason why we left Morocco is because we knew we couldn't travel Morocco anymore. We'd be stuck in the van. Uh, we'd have no personal space from other people walking in our camp area and sharing with other people the showers and laundry and sharing our space with a lot of people and we don't feel comfortable having ourselves or our children around people that don't have other campers that didn't have the same mentality um, regarding the virus as we did yeah and it's not really about what country is handling it better than one or the other it's, in fact Croatia is actually handling it really well their numbers are really low too and for us it was about coming to a comfortable place like I said earlier in the live stream, to have a bigger safe zone that we feel comfortable in. And also, the other thing is, a lot of 
a lot of uh, travel insurance companies are canceling people's health insurances because you know they're supposed to go home. So if you have the opportunity to go home, um, you sh you're supposed to go home. And if you didn't, if you choose to not go home, a lot of travel health insurance were being canceled. So you know we did not, we we were not going to have health insurance coverage in Morocco, regardless how safe it is. Um, you know, coronavirus wise, we were not going to be covered if something happened. And also, we did not have anybody there that could take care of our kids for us if the two of us both went down with the virus mm -hmm. and got s severely ill. And here we have all that. We have we have health insurance. We have uh, friends and family. We have a safe, large space, you know, as far as our standards are concerned. So it was really not about, oh, what's the best place to go do this? Because there are countries that have even less cases. And that would not be a better place for us. We could have gone down to Senegal. They have, you know, really, really low numbers. But that's not a better place. Our, the best place is here. And that's what, the, that's what the embassies were also telling all the people that were traveling. Go back to your home. And that's what you're supposed to do. How do we finance this lifestyle, Dan? Well, um... It was it had been hard for the last couple of weeks because through all the traveling and all the ordeal trying to get home I had not been able to work but we um, and, and also we have a we have a, uh, a rental property that's on Airbnb that within the last two months all the reservations were canceled mm -hmm. so yeah f financing it that's how we typically do it and I work I do about 10 hours a week of work but I had not been able to do that for the last three weeks or so so it's it's gonna be challenging but that but the nice thing for us is that we've been doing this for so long and we had figured all this stuff out and we had a lot of time to figure out how do we make this sustainable for us that um, you know we have been able to save up money so we can actually well we also, also tell people we have this other channel called freely roaming where we're showing people how to do some some of the stuff that we've done but we've been able to save our money so we can last three to six months without income. But of course, you know, that's our safety net. So we can do that. But like a lot of people right now, you know, finances are going to be tight. The finances mm -hmm. are going to be challenging. But that's another thing is being back here, even though we had to pay all the money to the ferries and the tolls and the diesel to get back here. Now that we're here, our, our expenses are going to be really, really low. So... It was a it was a sort of a one-time big investment to get us back to a comfortable safe place that we can sustain for a long time uh, let's see Easter break is quarantine break yeah there's no place like home if we were how do we deal with poop issues for a family of five so we were, yeah, so when we were outside of uh, Suta <laughs> and people were like filling up their, their tanks and emptying it outside, it was a problem, you know. But for us, um, we had started, I had always done this, but, you know, whenever we can go to, the, to pee outside, I would do it. And Luca would do it. Uh, but the girls and Marlene, you know, didn't, hadn't really gotten comfortable doing that. So we actually took that opportunity to figure out a way for them to use our little portable toilet. And we took one of their five liter water bottles and cut the bottom out. And then we put it inside the toilet. So the girls would go in there and then we would empty it outside so that we would empty all of our pee outside, which meant that our toilet could hold much more waste. So we actually have two five gallon portable toilets. And if we didn't, if we did what we started to do when we were stuck out there and people were filling up their toilets and not being able to empty it, we I think we probably could have last um, you know one to two weeks easily. But if we if we just normally speaking, like if we just all went to the bathroom in the portable toilet, each toilet can last us two days. But by being able to pee outside, we can extend that to maybe triple or quadruple the time. So yeah, we didn't have to do that, but fortunately, you know, thanks to the Moroccan authority, they when they opened up this this uh, this parking lot for all of us stranded.
travelers to, to, to be there and have the facilities. That really helped out a lot. Uh, what is the most number of watchers now in Morocco? <laughs> I don't know. There's, there's been a lot of new uh, Moroccan subscribers, and I welcome all of you guys. Thank you. And as somebody who, who saw it firsthand, the generosity of Moroccans is really unbelievable. So it's been really awesome. A oh, Crowsmar just gave us 100 Norwegian crowns. Thank you so wow. much. <laughs> That's very nice of you. Thank you. Do we have to go to Norway to spend this money? Because I'm, 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 I'm coming up there. Yeah, I look different after I shaved, huh? So, yeah, I usually don't shave this, this close. Usually what I do is I cut my hair with uh, just an electric buzzer. And then at the same time, I just shave using an electric shaver too. But my shaver is 110 volt US AC plug. So you can't use it here. Even with a little adapter, you can't. You have to use 110 volt or you're going to fry the motor. And the only way for me to use that electric shaver is to use the inverter in our van. And since we're stuck in the apartment, we can't even go to our van right now for, the, for another 11 days. I can't even go down there and shave really quick. So I had to use a razor. So I, sh I shave really close, much closer than I, than I normally do. But it'll grow out, and then you won't shave for a while again. Yeah, so <laughs> I don't grow hair that quickly. So in the last few videos where you saw I had, <laughs> you know, it's gotten, re <laughs> it's gotten really gray over the last few years. Probably even more gray <laughs> in the last couple weeks. But, you know, it's, uh, um, I, I grow... The, the places where you saw I had hair, not that much hair on the cheeks, just hair right here. That's pretty much the only place I grow. So it, it may look like I'm trying to grow like a, 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 some kind of groomed beard, but no, that's actually what happens when I don't shave at all. What happened to your hair, Luca? I loved it on the couch. Hmm. Can I come closer? Oh, we do have a Patreon. Um, if you... If you look at the description of this video, we have our Patreon down below. Cool hair, Luca. Troy says cool hair. Oh. Can we see your hair again? <laughs> Can you make it stand up taller? Okay. No? Even taller. By your hairstyle, my hair is way too long. Yeah, how did you do that hair? I, 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 I just put my head upside down and whipped it on the couch. Oh, is it weird having a couch? Yeah. <laughs> is it weird to have a couch? <laughs> is it weird to have a roof? <laughs> yeah, is it weird to not. So, there, this is a, this is a two bedroom apartment that Marlene's parents bought a few years ago, and usually when we're here, the kids just want to sleep on this couch but but usually we're not here for that long we're here for like a week maybe and then we'll you know we'll leave to go to the island or leave to go travel somewhere um those of you that are new to the channel that you you guys probably don't know but we um we spent since we've been to europe for the last two years we've spent nine months of the year exploring europe and then from october until january we're here because I have temporary residency in Croatia. It's good for one year at a time. So I have to go, I have to come back here in October and start my application process to renew my residency. And we don't know if I'm allowed to leave during that time, so we just don't. So between October and January, we're here. And we have this apartment that we have access to. And we also have a, a small stone house in the village on the island of Khvar that Marlene's dad grew up. Her grandfather built the house with his own bare hands and the help of a couple donkeys. And my grandma. Don't and, forget and her grandma. Grandma, grandma, <laughs> grandma helped too, of course. And we actually really love going there, but we're not allowed to go there right now. Because when, we, when I applied for residency, I had to choose an address. 
And we thought the address here would be better because we can. We, it's, a, it's a bigger city. It's easier for me to for us to walk from here to the police station to do paperwork and check on stuff. So we chose this address. And because of the lockdown, you're supposed to be at your address of residency. So we're not supposed to be able to just roam around and travel, which is a good thing. Very you know? good thing, especially the small village in the island. It's most young people left. It's mostly little old ladies and little old men and less people that can go to the island and pass the virus to the older generation that's the yeah. last the last of the village like i'm scared if if the older generation gets sick in the villages those villages are seriously just going to be ghost little ghost villages yeah There's because nobody there anymore people are usually only there uh on the weekends and in the <laughs> summer there are a lot of people there in the summer because a lot of people come from you know, wherever they left the country, some people went to Germany, some people went to Ireland, some people went to, you know, wherever else for work. And like Marlene's family, they went to the United States. And a lot of people went to like Australia and South America. But they all have their old houses in the village. So, and it's a great place to be in the summertime. You can go swimming in the, in the Adriatic Sea, you can do all this great stuff, and you can come back and connect. So in the summertime, it's actually really crowded, relatively crowded, I guess. But the times that we've been here between October and January, it's it's deserted. I mean, there's literally like I think three houses that have people in them, and they're just you know like old people that have always lived there, and their kids left, and their grandkids left. But this is where they have been their whole life, so they're staying there. But yeah, like Marlene said, if the virus got there, and they're only these are the only people that live there, so they will give it to each other. And bad things will happen. Here in Split, we live near um, the main hospital. And anything that happens on the islands, there's no big hospitals on the islands to, to you know, for them to go to. So there's this big helicopter that flies to the island and pick people up and bring them back to the Split Hospital. And when we're here, at least a couple times a week, we, we hear the helicopter fly. Every time we hear it, we feel like, wow, something happened, somebody's sick. Yeah. Bad news. Um, we've heard it once since we've been back the last three or four days. We also have the windows closed because it's kind of cold. Yeah. So it's probably Still playing a lot cold. more. Uh, somebody said, do we ever fear that we would not make it back to Croatia? I wouldn't say we feared because like a lot of people have said, you know, Morocco is quite safe. And I think I want to reiterate something that I've said before. In the comments and maybe one of the videos or two is that we were stuck in Morocco but it does not mean that we weren't welcome or felt safe in Morocco we were we felt completely welcome and safe the entire time and I think in one of my videos I even said well you know what's the most likely scenario that that you know before we knew that ferry was coming what's the most likely scenario what's the worst case scenario what's the best case scenario so we felt like the worst case scenario, well, the worst case scenario without us getting sick, right? The worst case scenario is that we didn't get a ferry and we would be in Morocco for the, for the foreseeable future. And that was actually mentally, we had to kind of accept that was a possibility. Mm -hmm. So we did mentally accept, okay, we may be at this isolation camp for a couple months to ride this thing out. And I don't think that was scary to us as long as we were able to mentally accept it and I think the thing that concerned me the most was how some of the other people that were at the camp who could not, maybe were not able to kind of mentally accept that. Because we did see, we saw a couple, one day, I think the two days before that we knew the ferry was coming, there were some like tense arguments between other campers. Mm -hmm. And there was one guy that was like, he just lost it. He started like pushing over barricades and cussing yeah. people out, yelling at people. More than anything else, it wasn't like I didn't feel safe about Morocco. I didn't feel safe being next to all the other unhinged travelers that we were near. I would have, I would have much preferred if the ferry wasn't coming, that they allow us to go somewhere else that was safer. The USACD is recommending wearing cloth masks and how you guys did at border crossings. Do you plan on wearing scarves and masks? Yeah, so wearing mask is a, you know, we always did. And I always also knew that, you know, like, it's not so much. And if you guys 
watch you know some of those videos you would have heard me say this multiple times too it is not so much it's not as much that the the whatever covering i was wearing was going to protect me because i know that like if it just clots it's not rated for any kind of viral protection or bacterial protection it was more for me to not expel any airborne virus or bacteria into the air if i had it so the thing is these surgical masks and these N95 masks and these other masks, people wear them at the hospital where, where they're working or the emergency workers wear them to protect themselves because that's what they're made for. But if you just wear a cloth mask, that will work too as long as everybody wore a cloth mask. Everybody wore some kind of mask covering. Then, you know, because you're not protecting yourself at that point, you're protecting others from you. So if everybody protected others from themselves, then it would be fine you know there was actually a guy you know we were we were uh, we were stuck in the camp with uh, our friends from New Zealand Cherie and uh, Simon I don't know if, uh, if they'll ever watch this but you know they were on the same ferry as us and there were a few people from um, the United Kingdom and one guy was like watching everybody wear cloth masks and said, oh that's not doing anything for you you know that's it goes right through and so he takes this off that really aggravated me because that was a very selfish thing for him to do by him taking his covers off because it wasn't protecting him that meant for him that he didn't care about what he was expelling into the air for other people because if you cover yourself and you're not letting anything come from you know from your airways airborne you're protecting other people if one person takes it down if that person has it that person can infect everybody else who's just wearing a cloth mask so yeah so that was really important um it is a requirement, I think, in Croatia for us to wear masks. You're talking well. really fast. <laughs> you gotta you got get these thoughts out. I know, but you're talking really fast. Okay, so um, let's see what else. How's the situation? Oh. No. Hamid, thank you. Hamid just became a patron. Thank you. Thank you, Hamid. That was very nice of you. Again, Moroccan people are amazing. Yes. And hopefully we can go back next winter like we we want to finish exploring Morocco because yeah there's so much more to see um Socorro's Socorro's go I'm guessing that's how I mean I know who you are I see you all the time but I, I never had to say your name or say your handle on on YouTube you're missing your kindergarten teachers or students in Fresno yeah you know what we have Zoom, and if you want to, <laughs> you know, give these kids a lesson now and then. You know, this is different for us because so much of our homeschooling has have been, like, revolved around location-based, right? We'll go to some place, and we'll teach them about the place. And then we'll do, like, audiobooks when we drive, and we'll do stuff when we drive. So we don't have any of those things that we're used to doing now. So homeschooling in an apartment like this is also yeah. new to us. Yeah, so. It's not as fun. <laughs> Uh, Caroline from Brazil hello yep we are good thank you for for your comment okay so situation in Croatia from Switzerland so the situation in Croatia is good um, they have pretty low numbers I think just over a thousand cases in Croatia mm -hmm. and I think maybe a little over a hundred or no less than a hundred fatalities I think it's like 16 oh really it's, it's I can look it up digit. I have I it right like here. That. I have a, a group on Viber that uh, tells me today one one thousand two hundred and twenty-two oh, yeah. people are infected with the 16. corona on Monday, Croatia. One hundred and thirty recovered. Sixteen people died. Yeah. So the numbers are really good here. It's actually um, incredibly good. Uh, the police evaluate what's happening in each city every day. So they notice people walking on the waterfront. They shut down the waterfront. Somebody's at the beach. Okay, today we got to shut down the beach. So every day they kind of shift things and rules, yeah. which is really good. They're, they're it's on a it. really dynamic situation like it should be. Just like how it was when we were in Morocco. Things were so dynamic. It was changing constantly, which is good because you don't want just you know a complete lockdown where people can't do anything. You want to kind of, you know, be able to evaluate the situation and then add add additional measures as needed. So yeah, people 
you know, for a while, people were like disobeying the, the, the rules and going outside. But I think for the most part, it's good now. Um, you see people walking around a lot still, but they're usually like carrying grocery bags or like walking their dogs or something. Yeah. You don't really see more than two people walking together. Mm -hmm. um, you know, you don't, I mean, of course we haven't left, but we have a pretty good view, you know, outside our window to see, you know, what else is going on. So, yeah, so we're, uh, you know, we're, we're pretty glad about the conditions in Croatia. Uh, we're optimistic about how things will turn, turn out here. But of course we drove through some of the heaviest, like have most heavily infected zones in in Europe, you know, which is I think I think Croatia in general, if you're coming from outside of the country during this time, you're going to be automatically quarantined. But especially for us, since we came, we drove through France, we drove through Germany, which are both at above or right around a hundred thousand infections each. Really, really serious places there, but. We know in, in our mind that we were safe because we drove we drove through there without basically nonstop. You know, we stopped at the border be, before Germany in France and we spent the night. We didn't even go outside. And then in Germany, we drove, you know, we shopped there. We, sh we shopped at a grocery store, but we were really careful. We wore our masks. People were really careful in there too. Mm -hmm. uh, Germany had a, uh, a no contact um, ordinance and they're really good at following those rules, mm -hmm. you know. So even at the store, when you're waiting in line, the Lidl to, to check out, the person at the checkout line was loading their stuff in, and the checkout person at the register had just complete plexiglass covers all the way around them. So, you know, you can't make any contact even if you wanted to. And the person behind you is like two meters away easily. So, yeah, so that's really good. Oh, it's Coco. Uh huh. Hi, Coco. Yeah, so Easter now in Norway. Schools are out, but I think school's going to be out for a while. But, you know, Easter also, usually that's like people's time to go travel. But I'm glad that people are not doing that. Yeah. How old were you when you found out camping is your passion? I'm going to go up to 611. Okay. Um, we didn't start this lifestyle until we had our first kid. Yeah, I don't know if camping is our passion. Um, it's not so much like, oh, we just want to go camp. Um, I can go back a little bit to tell you maybe the, the more complete story. Uh, some of our old, you know, subscribers have heard this probably a dozen times. But we are not like your typical, you know, got to travel, got to see the world type people until after we had kids. So at around 2007 is when we had our oldest, Ava, who's 13 now. And um, it was our first time being parents. We wanted to have, you know, have kids. And then we had our first child. And then at the same, the same year, after the year she was born, we lost our dog that we had for 11 or for 10 years. So that was like, you know, maybe a, a, a switch that was kind of flipped and say, wow, you know, like things don't last forever. You know, we want to, we, let's go take our newborn baby to go see, you know, see stuff. Let's go travel. Mm -hmm. But then me as the dad, always carrying the stroller and the, you know, the crib and suitcases and all the stuff constantly. It was like a lot of stuff for me to constantly take with me when we would fly somewhere or we would go and stay in a hotel and it was expensive. So that's when we decided, okay, I think traveling with a camper was the, was the way to go. So... That's kind of from that point on, we decided this is the way that we want to travel. And, you know, we gave it a, like a trial run for like a couple weeks. We went from California to Arizona. We loved it. We got a, a little bigger camper like the following year. And then we've been traveling like this ever since. Uh, Ranjith from India. Welcome from India. Thank Hello. you for thank you for watching. Uh, Nick, Nick uh, is glad that we're home. Thank you, Nick. Let's see. You're addicted to drive. How do you deal? How do you deal now without driving? <laughs> yeah. 
Um, you know, we've actually spent lots and lots of days driving nonstop, but then we'll spend days and days and days not driving at all. So this is actually pretty normal for us. You know, when we're here, when we're here uh, during the during the fall, like the last the last couple of couple of falls. What does that say? We can't focus. Oh, yellow, yellow belt. belt. Oh, is that your joke? Oh. I have a yellow belt. Okay. And what? Karate? Yeah. So when, usually when we're back in Croatia, we don't drive. You know, we park the car. Uh, right now we have to park the car downstairs, but. When we're allowed to go to the islands again, we'll take the van over to the islands and we'll park, we'll tuck it away. And for the entire time that we're here, we won't drive at all. I mean, we'll, when we're on the island, we'll maybe drive down to the beach. Maybe we'll spend a couple nights at the beach. Then we'll come back to the village. You know, we'll, we'll do stuff like that. But yeah, we can drive. I mean, the, the longest drive that we've done, we've done within a 24-hour period, basically nonstop. I say 24-hour period because... That day, we came back from Mexico, drove into Texas, and then we left the San Antonio, Texas area and drove all the way to Tucson, Arizona, uh, in one shot. Basically, just stopping to get fuel and food, and that's it. And I think that was like, gosh, 1,400 kilometers, maybe 1,600 <laughs> kilometers, like 1,000 miles almost. So we've done a lot of driving. You know, we didn't used to drive this much when the kids were little. When the kids were little, they didn't have the stamina to stay in the car for that long. But now that, you know, now we have the option to, and we can, which is nice. So yeah, so we did a lot of driving in the last two weeks. But um, before that, you know, we spent, we spent five weeks to get down to Agadir in Morocco. And then we spent one day driving back up when we knew that we wanted to try to catch the ferry. Will you come back to Morocco? And what was your plan? Uh, to come back, or what was yeah. our plan if we were our still plan there? if we were in Agadir, and we yeah. were gonna go. We were gonna continue all the way to the very southern portion of Morocco, and then right. slowly make our way up, up the coast. coast, so you can get some surfing, and the kids can boogie board. And then we were gonna hit the bigger cities. We we're gonna go to Marrakesh, maybe Casablanca, mm -hmm. um, maybe Tangier. Tangier, but. So we ha our yeah. plan, hopefully, is we can come back next winter and repeat and do what we didn't get to do. Yeah, we only did half of what we wanted to do before we came back. Just because we knew that this next half wasn't going to be possible for probably a year. And it's going to get really hot, you know. Like, you guys know from Morocco that it's going to get hot there. The people that are still there, it's going to be difficult to, to sleep in a, in a car when it's really hot. So, you know, that's the thing. We want to go back, and we only got to do half of what, what we originally planned to do. And before we decided to go to Morocco, or no, be, when we first decided we were going to Morocco, the original plan was like, oh, the surfing is amazing. All I heard about was how great the surf is. So I really wanted to go surf there. But then when we started doing some research, then we realized there's all this inland stuff we want to see too. How should we do this? So then we decide, okay, it's going to get hot. So it's better if we go inland into the desert, do Merzuga and all these, you know, warm places in the summer. Go do all that first. And then we can come back up the coast and surf for as long as we want up the coast. So I got zero days of surfing in. <laughs> By the time we got to the coast, I don't know if you guys know, we haven't uh, uploaded the video yet of why we ended up in Agadir. It was because of these small puppies. And if you guys haven't seen... Marlene's stories, um, when we were in Tough Root, we found a box of six one-day-old puppies. And I, people knew about them, but nobody wanted to help, which was very disappointing. And we took it on and, and figured out a, you know, a formula that we could buy from this, the ingredients we had in the stores there and started hand-feeding these puppies. And the reason why we ended up in Agadir is because there was a... <laughs> there was a... Uh, um, an animal shelter called Morocco Animal Aid. Um, we had heard about them through a friend who was who was in Morocco, who still is in Morocco, actually. They um, they were camping at the place we were. We ended up camping at before we left, and they visited the shelter. And then we saw the location tag, 
So when we got these puppies and we knew that we couldn't handle them, you know, in, inside the van, that's why we drove over there. But they have these puppies still, and she's been, the, the person who runs it, Lucy, she's been sending us videos of these puppies. Yeah. I mean, it's, uh, it's amazing how well they're doing. So all of you that have supported Morocco Animal Aid, I really appreciate you guys. I really thank you because, you know, they're doing amazing work for all the stray animals in Morocco and all the injured animals in Morocco. Mm -hmm. um, you know, like, I don't know. It's a it's a tough it's a tough situation where, when, in some countries like, some people don't have enough food, so it's hard for them to really spend the time and energy and money to like, you know, take care of stray animals, but they feel pain. They have needs, and you know the fact that Morocco Morocco Animal Aid and also the Inswan Project, which is now they're combined as one organization that they're doing amazing things that's that's really cool so all of you that helped out and donated the money to them i want to really thank you guys for that okay oh yeah so anyways we, we're gonna the plan is to go back to morocco next winter uh obviously that's all pending like this thing going away and traveling is cool again and i think it will be i personally think that there needs to be uh, a really effective treatment in place before we have a vaccine and hopefully a year from now we'll have a vaccine and this won't be a problem Troy is an Australian living in Germany cool hope you're doing well Troy uh, different Troy not Troy Brady <laughs> I see you there too how's it going our daily routine gosh our daily routine you know um, Actually, the last three days had just been really us, like, catching up. Like, sort of slowly wind our brains back down from the mental stress. Mm -hmm. I think a lot of the mental stress had been building up. And it's hard to know, like, some nights we'll go to bed, you know, when we're in uh, isolation camp. We'll go to bed and we'll be like, do I have corona? Like, <laughs> I have a headache. Do I have a fever? No, I don't have a fever. Like, what's... Did I touch something today and like infect myself? Like what happened? So you really get yourself psyched out yeah. into thinking like, okay, maybe got, I, I contracted the virus. But so much of like, but we were really careful. But you, what you don't want to do is get so overwhelmed mentally that you forget to do the things you're supposed to do physically. So we were really focused on that. So it was a, that's why I keep saying that it was a heavy mental load. But we were slowly letting that go. Because we're in a safe space now that we don't have to think about the kids touching stuff. We can do whatever we want. But we've been just kind of letting that mindset wind down. So we haven't really gotten into a full-on like routine yet, I wouldn't yeah. say. Um, like we woke up at different times the last three days. Like today I woke up at, at 11 o'clock. <laughs> like last night I had a, a cup of tea way too late. Mm. So I stayed up till much later. But then the night before, we had a we had a virtual like party with with our friends in California, so that we were up for a while during that too. So we haven't really gotten to a good routine yet, but I think we will. Like we're starting to today was our first attempt at working, at schooling, and doing all the things that we're supposed to do. But Marlene is going to be putting quarantine videos on our Instagram account <laughs> if you guys want to. Look, can you take a photo of us? On our live stream. Okay. Uh, Thank you. Yeah, Cor Croatia's really nice. Uh, Marzar is from the city Ifni. We that's where we were gonna go. We were city Ifni was gonna be our next stop. That's had right. we not found the puppies, and had the lockdown not happened. Um, let's see. Scrolling. Ta me, take tequila picture. tea party. I'm assuming this is the same tequila tea party from Instagram. New Jersey. Cool. <laughs> Hanan says you're so nice and beautiful, but Crowsmar says uh, hands off. <laughs> Our apartment is two bedrooms. Two bedroom, one bath. It's a typical like uh socialist era 
Croatia apartment built made with concrete and everything. But um, after Marlene's parents bought it, they did a nice like remodeling job. My dad's addicted really nice. to home improvement, yeah. so he spends half his time in Croatia, half in the U.S. And the entire time he's in Croatia, he's working on fixing things. And now he's back in the U.S. fixing things. <laughs> there's a thing dangling. Somebody said there's a there's a unit oh, from on the, the van. air van. Oh, on the van. On the van? Wait. I Maybe on the van. Be careful, buddy. Yeah, sometimes we dangle like a little LED lantern from our fan. Maybe that's maybe that's what it is. Oh yeah, for extra light. Yeah. So Hamas says I've always wanted to do a road trip through Europe, mostly Central and Western. Starting point being Morocco. Uh, Central and Western. If you start in Morocco, I think the 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 place that makes the most sense is to go well it depends on if you're going to do a clockwise loop or a counterclockwise loop right so if you go from morocco to italy then you could do you can go up through central europe right you can go do you know czech republic uh poland and i would i would highly recommend if you have the time to go all the way up through um like Lithuania and Estonia and Latvia and then go into Finland. I mean, that's That's gonna be a longer trip. Yeah, but that's what we did the first year um, First summer we went up to Scandinavia Obviously, you know, it's gonna be a completely different world than what you're used to seeing in Morocco, but and It's beautiful in a, a different way, but you know just as amazing <laughs> okay, Hanan is a girl, so okay. we don't have to worry. <laughs> we don't, well, I mean, we don't know, but okay. <laughs> I'm assuming, yeah, that is a that is a that is just purely just a compliment okay. for you. So say thank you. Thank you. Guys, okay. I think the sound here isn't doing that fine. It's really low. Trying to sort out this problem, please. What's the know. sound? Oh. The sound is low? Or it could be Luca throwing, uh, yeah. doing special effects snow in the live stream. <laughs> yeah, we can talk a little closer to the mic. Maybe that'll help. Marzar saw us in Asala. Yeah, so that was our first day. Yeah. Yeah, we were, were there on the first day. Uh, are you willing to go back to Morocco because the virus kind of ruined it? Casablanca. No, of course. I mean, the, the virus, the virus is ruining it for everybody around the world. So, you know, it's not, in fact, I think the only, the only thing that's changed for us is that it's delayed. In fact, I would even say because of the virus, we're going to spend even more time in Morocco because mm. before had we had the virus not hit, had this not happened, we would have just uh, did our 90 days in Morocco and then came back to Spain and then continue our, our summer plans, which was going to, the, going to the UK and go to Scotland. But because of this, when we go back to Morocco next winter, we'll do another full 90 days. Mm -hmm. So we'll end up doing like, you know, 140 days or something like that total. So yeah. And now that we know everything about how to take the ferry and how to get our Morocco Telecom SIM cards and how to, you know, where to go shop and all this stuff, it's going to be much easier for us. We're going to be able to focus so much more on just the exploring aspect, not the logistics, like figuring out how to do things. Uh, <laughs> somebody said, no, I, no, I look van built camping. Want to go to Morocco too. <laughs> you should. Okay. From Qatar, I'm Moroccan. Really enjoy watching you since you have been, Stuck in Suta. I hope you're doing well. Thank you. We're doing well in quarantine. We we are in day technically four. day four so um, Like as far as we know we have no symptoms So I have n no reason to believe that um, That it won't stay like this for the for the next ten more days So, you know assuming that's the case by the time we're done with our quarantine here 
will be uh, in self-isolation, but we're allowed to go outside and shop for food and, you know, do the essential stuff. Uh, let's see. Yeah, I don't know about the sound. I think it's okay. Don't forget to visit Chef Shawan. We did go to Chef Shawan. In beautiful. fact, yeah, we'll we'll probably go back because we only walked around um, the M Medina for one afternoon mm -hmm. in Chef Shawan because Chef Shawan was the second place we went to. Mm -hmm. We went from Asala to Chef Shawan, and we spent two nights there. Mm -hmm. But if we're gonna go back, we'll probably we know exactly where to go now. Uh, we'll probably end up going back to some of the same places we went to again, and. In the last video, I said I'm going to catch up on the videos. So I'm working on the Asala video now. Uh, that's going to be the next video. And then the Chef Shawan videos right after that. Yeah, Chef Shawan is really cool. Now, it's probably like the first Medina experience that we had. Even though we walked through the small Medina in, in uh, Asala. But it was really small. It was just kind of getting our feet wet a little bit. Um, no, that's the ice. Uh, ice maker. Ice maker. Yeah, we're gonna Garth from Alberta, Canada. <laughs> cool. Hi, hey, Garth. Hope you're doing well in Canada. Uh, do you personally know anyone who has contracted COVID-19? My friend's daughter in the U.S. is a confirmed case by recovery. Not in the U.S. Uh, well. Do we? We know people. Y yes, we do, but they they didn't have severe symptoms, so they didn't get tested. But as far as they know, they have all the, they had all the symptoms. Um, I think it was early on, so testing was was difficult. So we don't know anybody who has severe uh, reaction that has severe symptoms. But yeah, we have, we know. Um, well, I don't know if I don't know if Holly's on here. Holly actually said. Maybe you can share. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> uh, let's see. Love your journey through Europe and found it very interesting to watch. Thanks for sharing. You're welcome. Thank you, Peter. Allie, happy for your brother. Calling you a brother. Oh, calling me. Okay, yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Ali. It's Ali. From Johnstown, New York. Truck driver in the U.S. Awesome. Hope you stay safe. New York is a hot... It's a hot spot. I hope wherever you are, it's safe. And if you're a truck driver, I'm guessing you're still working. So thanks for being out there. Uh, hello from North Idaho. Cool. North Idaho is, I'm guessing, in the Coeur d'Alene area. Beautiful area. Cold still, though, right? I think. Um, what is your job? Lamara Ketchy said, I watch your Camper Bill video. I'm good at a lot of things, if not everything. Well, I mean, <laughs> not everybody agrees. Before we built the van, <laughs> I always like telling this. Before we built the van, when we were thinking about building the van, Marlene's like, I don't think you should do this. <laughs> I mean, why? I've seen you build stuff before. It's not, it's not pretty. It's not going to be good. Yeah. I'm like, we could do this, Marlene. We could do this. I just watch a lot of YouTube videos. We do this. No, she was really against us building the van ourselves. Well, no, she wanted to build it ourselves, but she was really against me like making cabinets and stuff like that in the there. The kitchen cabinet, I was really the kitchen scared cabinet. about. The only th I knew we do the rest, but the kitchen cabinet we could build it, but is it gonna look nice? And even Marlene's dad was like, <laughs> "Oh no, you shouldn't do this. You shouldn't do this. You go to you go to Home Depot, you buy one of these ready-made cabinets, and you put it in there." I'm like, no, that doesn't work. The walls are curved. You're going to lose so much space. We don't want as deep of a cabinet. We want it to be kind of shallower than normal, maybe a little taller than normal. Like a stand, like a ready-made cabinet wasn't going to cut it. So, yeah, Marlene had very little faith, but <laughs> trust me, you can do anything you want. Now you have YouTube, right? You can just learn everything from YouTube. <laughs> uh, let's see. Do you check your tires, Dan? Every time I, every every time we stop, I check my tires. Of course, this is from twelve years of traveling on the road. I mean, we've never had a blowout. We've had uh, five different campers. 
the closest we've ever had a blowout was our first or second camper. And it was from me checking the tire. We had a belt separation and then checking the tire and we saw a bubble on the tire like this big. Yeah, so switched it out. So of course, checking the tires is a, is a regular thing. We didn't get to Asura, Asarora. I don't know how to say that. <laughs> we didn't make it there actually. You just made a bunch of Moroccans laugh. So good yeah. job. All right. <laughs> We didn't make it there. That was gonna be, that was gonna be our one of our stops for surfing along the coast, going up north. So, yeah, we have to go there. Uh, Nix's sound is fine. Good. Cool. Ireland is waiting for us. I we we met um, we met a family just outside of Azru in the cedar forest, like our first week in Morocco. Uh, she's, she's Australian and the husband is French, but she's an Australian from Ireland. And I think them as a family, they have two kids. They lived in Ireland. So they knew we were, our plan was to go to the UK. So they had, in, in Ireland, they had given us all these different places that we could go in Ireland. So yeah, really disappointed that we didn't get to go this summer. Next summer. Hopefully. Yeah. Okay, so Hamid said exactly what I was thinking through Germany, then all the way to Scandinavia. I've been to Scandinavia by playing very short breaks. I'm not sure about driving through Poland. Driving through Poland is fine. Um, you know, we didn't stop at a lot of places in Poland. There's some really beautiful forests that we camped at in, in, in Poland in the, in the southern part. Um, near, oh, I forget the, this, this city. But anyways, but we were in, uh, we were in, War, we were in Warsaw, outside of Warsaw for... Um, like almost a week, I think. Yeah, doing a Dometic movie. Yeah, it was just really hot. You know, it's it's in the it's it's inland, and we were there like during May, mm -hmm. and it was just like the humidity, and then the air was like you know it was it was hard to camp. But yeah, that's the that's the tough part for us. Like we know where to go in the summer. We go north. We go to Scandinavia. We go to Scotland, and we know where to go there in the winter. Last winter we went to Greece, Turkey, and this past winter we went to uh, Spain and uh, Morocco. But Central Europe is a tough one because you know you don't want to go any other. You want to go when it's not like it's hard to find a good weather window. Is what I'm trying to say. So, yeah. I don't know how long Hamid your trip would be, um, but I would try to set aside. A good amount of time because otherwise you just be doing a lot of driving you pay a lot of money for tolls and ferries and stuff like that but you know if you build out a van and they can drive you spend a good six months to a year driving around Europe you're gonna you're gonna be able to see some really cool stuff okay so the 90 day standard time can you spend in most countries I think 90 days pretty standard mm -hmm. I don't think there's any specific reason why all these countries have to set a 90 day period they just do <laughs> i don't know why i think somebody did it and they all do it of course you know because the 90 day the 90 out of 180 day is also the schengen limit so yeah 90 days seems to be the standard um you know almost every country that we go to is like that and if you're in a country that's not the schengen zone like croatia it's part of the eu but not schengen uh you can also be here for 90 days uh albania However, I think Albania, for American citizens, which we are, uh, dual citizens, you can be in Albania for, I think, a whole year. Mm. So, that's really cool. Uh, how do you manage to communicate in other languages, especially when you're in Morocco? We obviously speak English, which is a really handy language to know how to speak when you, when you travel. Um, but we also can understand a reasonable amount of French and Spanish. The speaking part is really bad, but you know we'll use Google Translate. Uh, we'll just use you know hand gestures and hand signals. I think it's not it's not impossible and it's not hard if you can just have the right expectations, you know, and then do a little bit of research. Like if you before you talk to somebody, know that okay. Ask them if they speak English. If they don't, 
then try to use the words that you know in the languages that they do speak. So yeah, um, French, knowing a little bit of French was helpful in Morocco because everybody seems to speak French. And more and more younger people will speak English. We found a lot of people that spoke English there really well, so that was cool. But yeah, I mean, you know, a, a small minority, but, you know, more than I expected. Marlene speaks Croatian. Mm -hmm. So, you know, in Eastern Europe, that helps a lot because you have uh, Slovenian. That's similar. It's not the same, but similar. But a lot of Slovenians speak Croatian. Uh, obviously, Croatia, Bosnia, Serbia, Montenegro, they all speak basically the same language so knowing croatian will get you by all those countries and then albania is a totally different thing albania is like i got no idea uh it's kind of like you know like uh like when we're in when we're in greece no we know we, we have nothing and when we're in turkey we got nothing but some of these countries where they're very popular in tourism and their language is not widely spoken you get more people there that will speak english so that's kind of nice you know because in europe when you travel around europe europe is like all these different countries with all these different languages but for whatever reason it may be because of the uk maybe because of the united states like the common language that people learn to speak as travelers is english so that's helped us a lot that makes it easier but you know, I think a lot of us get over that initial fear of asking and talking and trying to figure it out. Sometimes just some sign language and just pointing to things. That's all, really all you need a lot of the time. Okay, so where are we? We are. Are you guys American? Yeah, yes, we are uh, dual citizens. We are U.S. citizens. Uh, I was under the impression that military planes were available for U.S. citizens in Morocco. That is we did not hear anything about that. Not military, but there was chartered planes. Yeah. And there is an option for U.S. citizens to leave Morocco, but it would have cost our family seven and a half thousand dollars to go back to the U.S. And like Dan said earlier, we changed our residency and our health care to Croatia. So if we go back to the U.S., we wouldn't have a place to isolate or quarantine for 14 days. We don't have health care, and that is not our home country at the moment. Right now, our home country is in Europe and Croatia. Yeah, and, you know, I guess things are also changing there a lot. And I think they just maybe implemented some rule about even people without insurance can get reimbursed if they happen to contract a virus. But still, it's, it's, not, it's not an ideal situation for us because we would have to leave the car there and pay more than double what we ended up paying to leave, plus paying for storage of the van, plus not knowing you know, what the condition was gonna be in and leave a bunch of our stuff behind. How it happened for us was the best case scenario, being able to come back here. But yeah, military plane, somebody was like, oh, go to a military base. I don't think the military base would have done anything for us. They would have referred us to the embassy, and then the embassy would have in turn told us about the charter plane we have to buy a ticket so and that's how it was for everybody people who weren't moroccans that were trying to go home if they wanted to get on a plane um there had to be a special plane chartered for citizens of that country and you have to pay you have to buy a ticket that's how it was um how did the kids learn our kids learn just like how the kids are learning around the world right now who can't go to school they're homeschooled Books and apps and online programs and real life. Yeah. And the Indie Project says, so happy you guys are back safely. Thanks. Thank you, guys. And I'm guessing your guys' uh, trips yeah. is a little bit delayed as well. So, you know, Sorry hopefully things work out. But, yeah, I mean, that's how it is for everybody, I guess. Any update on the situation back in Tangier Med? Are fair still running to friends? We don't know, you know. Um... I was sharing my videos on a couple of uh, Facebook groups about our experience there, but they're not very active. So I think there's probably other Facebook groups that are more active. When I was sharing them, it was more just about, you know, getting the information out there so people that want to go up there can go up. But since then, I've not seen any information come up. There was somebody, there was a woman from Holland whose son was there 
and she was trying to get her son onto the Thursday, the last Thursday ferry, and I heard that, that that he did get on. But you know, there were other people that are in less fortunate situations. Like there was somebody from Belgium that was that I was reading the comments about. And he asked me some questions that I couldn't really help him. He didn't have a car, so he wanted to know if passengers can go on the ferry, and I didn't know because you have to get to this this parking lot where we we're at and stay there and wait. And if you didn't have a car, where would you sleep? And it would be quite dangerous, I think, to just be out in the open constantly. So yeah, I'm not sure. I'm assuming the Tanger Med situation is still going on. And if there are people that want to go back, I think the ferries will keep running. Um, if it's happening every three days, like it was for us, actually every four days, we got on the Sunday and then the next ferry was on a Thursday. So if, if it was every four days, there should be another ferry tomorrow. But I have not heard anything yeah. about that. Uh, let's see. Croatia government recommends self-isolation through 430 like the U.S. Um, there, the rule for Croatia is once the last person, once their numbers stop growing, then three weeks after that. Okay. Or once I didn't people hear stop stop getting infected, then in three weeks after that, then it self isolation should be done. That's actually a pretty good idea. So it can give people expectations. So people, I think the bottom line is like everybody wants to know. Everybody wants to know like what is your method of measurement? Like how do you know it's going to get extended or not? So as long as they're reporting numbers, then people can use that rule to decide: mm-hmm. are the numbers still going? Are the numbers still going up? So I don't know, but at the same time, I don't think the number will ever stop going up. It will just slow. Yeah. Right? Until we have vaccination, people will still get it. It's not stopping anytime soon. No. Tell you that much. Yeah. <laughs> it's going to get extended. I think it's going to definitely go past the end of April. Uh, let's see. What do we do for a living? Oh, we, we mentioned it earlier. I, I'm a, I work 10 hours. I, actually, I didn't say that. I'm a web developer. So I work for uh, a company in the U.S. as a web developer. Let's see. You did a great job in the cabinets, but don't forget I helped you. <laughs> Got that right. <laughs> I'm of course the helper. you did. Yeah, it's an amazing construction guy, but I was the helper for sure. She did all the painting, or all the staining and the ceiling. Yeah. Yeah. Even I helped build a oh. little tiny bit, one yeah. tiny little plate thing. Mm-hmm. You helped lay the tiles. It did that. One little pile. <laughs> so I guess that makes me part of it. Let's see. What time are you at? Uh, I'm at. Let's see. Oh, this is my mom. Good to see you guys in comfortable place and safe. Your brother and I are so happy. Say hello to the kids. Grandma says hello. Say hi to Grandma. Hi, Grandma. Hi. Welcome home. <laughs> Father. Hope you guys are doing good in Croatia. Greetings from Marco. German is very hard. Yeah, I guess Troy. Troy, you're the Australian in Germany, right? German, I've not tried to learn German. You know? You like to say some words sometimes. Some words, yeah. I won't say what they are. <laughs> I only know one bad word because this one lady, German lady, was walking on a rock wall and the water was splashing her. She's like, oh, Scheiße. Hey. <laughs> Sorry. This is a family friendly channel. Um, I think it would have been very hard to leave your van in Morocco. It, we know people that did it. Uh, we know people that left their van in the airport parking lot, which is not ideal. I well, actually know two people who, who've done that. Uh, one person did it last year before all this happened. And another couple who, who's in the van like ours, they're from Canada. They left their van at the Casablanca parking lot, and then they flew back to Canada. And get it out. You have so, to use like a pencil. Did I ever find Taco Bell delivery? Oh, why do you got to bring that up? Why? Come on. Why? <laughs> yeah, Troy's been in uh, in Germany almost four years. 
four years, you gotta you gotta pick up a decent amount of German by now, right? Just like you picked up a lot of Croatian. Yeah, I, <laughs> a little I, bit. I can You're understand right. a lot, but I haven't been here four years. That's true. I have no idea what time of day it is. It is seven o'clock, seven p.m. Olivia is in Oregon. Good morning, Oregon. Uh, you've been Mexico, Brazil, Colombia, dangerous places. Uh, we've not been to Brazil or Colombia. Um, but we have lots of friends who have been. You know, there are dangerous places in every country. You just got to know. You got to be smart. You got you to gotta know where to go. But by and large, like, if you are smart and you, and you pay attention, you are careful. Like, Co Colombia and Brazil should, should be fine. We have lots and lots of friends who have gone through South America. Uh, we drove through. We, were, we basically lived a, almost a full year in Mexico. In 2015 or in 16 so it's uh you know it's changing I think you know every every year is different different things happen different things you read about but you certainly read way more about the scary stuff than it actually is down there I have no hesitation at all to go to Mexico like I think Mexico will be probably even a great place to live you know it's I always say that Morocco like Mexican people are super friendly, super nice, just like Morocco. Mexico has like beautiful beaches, great surf, uh, mountains. They have a huge volcano. Like I think one of the biggest mountains in the world is in Mexico. So there's different, really diverse terrain, just like Morocco. And I always say like Morocco is like Europe's Mexico. Both countries, you know, we love are, are some of the places that we'd love to go back. Mike Haggerty is on Vancouver Island. Ooh, beautiful. Very Lucky. Beautiful there. Uh, let's see. South Central Washington. Cool. South Central Washington. That is like, I get is that like, uh, that's like Vancouver, Washington, right? Or is that further, are you further east than that? Or are you in like the, the Tri Cities area? Yeah. Happy that we're home. Yeah. Cool. Follow us the whole time, the Croatia border. Somebody from Helsinki, Finland. You have Taco Bell there. <laughs> Lucky. It's expensive and it's fancy. <laughs> Not the Taco Bell that we know. Uh, let's see. How do you envision travel when your kids are teenagers? One of them is already a teenager. So, and the other one is like two, about two years away. So, yeah. We don't know. We know a little bit. We just play by ear. Yeah. Yeah. We know a little bit. We may switch to a different mode of traveling. You hope. I've been hoping <laughs> for that different mode for a while. Um, somebody says our kids are beautiful. Say thank you. Somebody says you're beautiful. Thank you. From Swaziland. Cool. What's cool. Swaziland? Yeah. The hey, there's Holly. Holly's Hello. here. Holly, hope you're doing well. Um, I didn't say anything. I was supposed to. <laughs> Do you kids ever talk about getting sick of traveling so much? Wondering as they get older, they're teenager dumb. Hmm. Well, why don't you ask them? Yeah. Stand up. Uh, you know you're on live stream. I know. Okay. When we're all teenagers, we should get like a, a something like a tour bus. We should live in that. <laughs> we can't all fit in the van anymore. <laughs> like at that campsite next to the wall. When you're all teenagers, like when Luca's a teenager, Ava's going to be like 18. Same thing. So Ava's going to have a van. You guys going to live with Ava. <laughs> no! <laughs> no, I want, a to I want to live in a tour bus. You guys want to live full time in a house or you guys want to keep traveling? Travel. Travel. Not chanting. You're not not chanting. chanting. Not at all. Uh, what do you guys think about Morocco? Somebody wants to know. And then they did two dancing emojis. <laughs> wait, wait, wait. <laughs> what was your favorite thing in Morocco that we saw? Uh, that or that you did? Or you did? The blue city. Oh, uh, Chef Shawan. Beautiful. Mm -hmm. My favorite. One of my favorite parts was that white cat. 
Oh, that was in Chef too. Yeah. Yeah. That was so, it was so pretty. I like the boogie boarding. Oh, yeah. And that was our first yeah. day. Ava liked the waves. And the yeah. puppies. Yeah, and the, the puppies, puppies. Yeah. yeah. They're walking yeah. and opening their eyes now. Yeah. How about the Saharan Desert was pretty cool. What about the camel Except ride? For, oh, yeah. My cam I I predicted that my camel would go rogue on me. I predicted <laughs> really? it. Yeah, remember I was saying I hope my camel doesn't go rogue on me and then it tried to run away. Your camel <laughs> your camel your camel was Chewbacca. He's very loud. Yeah. It's very loud. I predict the future. My life's just Please keep um, away. Somebody said we live in Belgium, our teenagers love traveling with us as a family. That's cool. You know the thing about our kids is like they they don't know any other way of life. Is that supposed to be an insult? Yeah, it's very <laughs> insulting. Um, they, we started traveling when our oldest was just a year old. So, you know, I think people ask us a lot, like, hey, we want to do what you guys are doing, and we have three kids that are the same age. But the tricky part is that they have lived a different life up until now. And to kind of take them away from what they know is much, much harder than to have them already live in this lifestyle this whole time. So I think that's tricky. Uh, YouTube, create these situations where you can get updates from your journey. Pray for all of you. Get tremendous relief when you get home. Thank you. Thank you. We are, we are very relieved. Welcome to Algeria. Ooh, cool. We had not, you know, like, I don't want to get in. I, I don't know any of the politics between Morocco and Algeria. I know there's some issues that's why the borders closed and I, and I know that it was difficult for us to get outside of morocco into other countries but we will love one day to visit more of africa piracy is still pampered instantly it is can you guys go to the work do you plan to travel to the southern part of africa like yeah botswana and namibia yeah exactly that's that's what what that's what we hope to do one day but the tricky part about our situation is our van is a relatively new van. It's a 2017 uh, van from the United States. It's a Sprinter van, but it was meant for the U.S. market. So that means it has a lot of these emissions control devices that are built into it that are still in place. So we need to have ultra-low sulfur diesel. We need to have uh, AdBlue DEF. We have, uh, you know, we have um, all these different emissions control and needs like... If anything goes wrong, it goes into cripple mode. So my biggest concern with this vehicle is to be too far away from places that can service it if something does go wrong. Because once you go into cripple mode, you can go 500 miles and then the engine just shuts off. So this is not the ideal car to do that. So we're not planning to do that with this vehicle. And in order for us to switch to a different vehicle, it's gonna take some planning and some time. So yeah, one day we love to do that, but. Not with this car, not with this vehicle. At least not without, you know, some serious modifications to make it capable to do that. Will you ever get another cat? Maybe one day. Yeah, we will. But not too soon. <laughs> let's just say, <laughs> let's just say, okay, wait, stop it. <laughs> let's just say that uh, we started traveling in 2007, no, 2008. Uh, a year after our dog passed away and we still haven't gotten another dog <laughs> we were very tempted with a lot of yeah. different dogs and puppies and we Especially still resist it but the reality is though a lot of people that we were with in Tafru when we found these little puppies they couldn't look after these puppies because they had their own dog inside their van and to have five little puppies and like a big grown dog is I, I understand it was really difficult but the, the fact that we were the fact that we were able to take care of these puppies when we were there is because we didn't have a dog already so that would you know create a problem or a cat or a cat or right because our cat wouldn't have appreciated that it would have we couldn't save those puppies if we still had our cat not easily anyways no yeah so we will get another dog or cat or something at some point mm -hmm. but right now you know, we're getting updates from Lucy from Morocco Animal Aid with puppies. Their eyes are open. They're and walking. They're, they're wagging their tail. Their legs work. They're, yeah, <laughs> they're, they're rolling. They're, like, on, they're but they're still. The floor. They're, they're following her. 
for more food constantly. So yeah, they're they're doing good. And um, they're not sleeping in a box. They're not sleeping in the box. No. They uh, we're hoping we have four people that have reached out to us and say that they want to adopt them. They're all from the United States. So we're hoping that, and then we have a friend, our friend Brittany in in Arizona, uh, says that she'll take them all. So I think what well, we're gonna try to figure this out. If we can get all five of them flown to Arizona to start out at our friend Brittany's place, and then um, from there, uh, you can find her on uh, minimal minimalist farm on Instagram. Uh, you can see she's got all kinds of fostering experience. She has animals and of all, all different types on her property. Um, she's the one that gave us the recipe to make puppy formula when we first found them in Tafruit because we couldn't find goat milk at, in Tafruit for some reason. So our plan would be able to have all the puppies there and then from there, like, get them adopted out to the people that have wanted them. Um, there's a chance that my sister will take one and there's a chance that I'm trying to convince my brother to take one. But there's two other or three other people that have uh, reached out and said that they want to adopt them. So I'm hoping this really works out because this is this would be amazing news. It would be even more amazing if people we know actually adopted these dogs because then we'll be able to go visit these dogs well, for the foreseeable future. Though. But that's still good to take it's still good. Care of. Maybe Brittany will take one. Has too many so let's see. Big house, uh. Now they discover COVID-19 can transmit human to cats and vice versa. Yeah, you know what? I, the, I saw the tiger thing. I saw the thing about the uh, the, tiger, the Bronx Zoo, I think, where the tiger was tested for COVID-19. Um, yeah, that I actually saw, like like a week ago, I saw something about somebody's dog who had it. I didn't know the, the, you know, the, the truth back then or not, but this information about the tiger in the Bronx Zoo seems to be legit so but you know I mean it doesn't really change anything um, you just you have to stay home until you know people can be safe and just yeah it's gonna be tough you don't want to pet stray dogs and cats I, I guess for the time being keep that on your exclusion list and hopefully you know and I know that I, I watch uh, Bill Gates interview by Trevor Noah on YouTube and he's talking about through the Gates Foundation funding uh, concurrent development of factories to develop vaccines uh, viable vaccines I guess right now there's about seven viable vaccines that are being tested and usually what happens you wait until testing gets to a certain phase and then you figure out which one is going to get approved and then you build a factory to build that one but what Bill Gates is doing through his foundation is that he's developing, he's, he's starting, he, I think he donated like $100 million from his foundation to bootstrap the building of all seven factories, knowing that it's going to cost billions of dollars and a majority of those factories will, will end up going to waste. Maybe they'll repurpose it to, to build something else. But the amazing part is that he's like, the fact that we can kind of start this now, just gamble that we're going to, Go with all seven. One or two of them will work out. And, you know, majority of them won't. Uh, but it's going to save, take months off of, you know, the actual development of the vaccine, which could equate to trillions of dollars worldwide. So a few billion dollars, if if governments and and you know large foundations like the Gates Foundation can do it, he's doing all of us a huge favor. Uh, let's see. All Croatians look like Modric. <laughs> Um, Christians do have a certain look, for sure. Cost of fortune to ship pets. I did it to US, USA to UK. Um, yes and no, because Morocco Animal A have done a lot of this. And what they'll do is they'll find out which, which airline allows people to bring their pets onto the plane. And they actually told us it's much easier to ship from Morocco, to take a pet from Morocco to North America than it is from Morocco to Europe mm -hmm. because Europe doesn't have the uh, rabies virus it's been eradicated so it's much more strict to bring Moroccan animals to Europe but whereas the US dogs get rabies vaccines but rabies is not eradicated so it still exists so it's actually much easier to bring pets from Morocco to North America 
So what Morocco Animal Aid have done in the past is they'll give volunteers that fly into Morocco to visit from all over the world. And then they'll figure out like, okay, are you going back to Canada? Are you going back to the US? Okay, can you take these dogs with you on your plane? And they'll book a flight on an airline that allows pets. So that's how they've done it in the past. And hopefully they can do something similar. We have an episode where we talk about exactly how we shipped our car from California to Europe. Uh, if you go back in our channel as well. You said your camera cuts out after an hour or something? I don't know. It's buffering. Maybe it's uh, the Stavi. Is it working? I think. Just say it went with the one on the internet. Yeah. Oh. I think it's okay. It's just buffering. Let's just see if it finishes buffering. We will, um, I think we'll try to do more live streams for the next 10 more days while we're here. Um, as I'm putting more videos up, if you, you know, we don't have comments right now. So this is actually one of the ways for us to get comments. I know that some of you that are new to my channel, you don't know this history behind it because when I started uploading, Moroccan uh, videos of us being in Morocco getting stuck there comments came back for those like six or seven videos And then the second I we got back into Europe comments got turned off again. I don't know why well I know the original reason why they turn off our comments But then they implemented all these like, you know, because we have minors that appear in our videos but when they implement all these minor protection features in YouTube Everybody's supposed to get their comments back if you just say, okay, this is not made for kids. This is blah, blah, blah. But we somehow slipped through the cracks. Us and at least one other channel that I know of still don't have our comments back. But why these other videos I uploaded from Morocco have it, I have no idea. So um, maybe I have to VPN into Morocco and upload it through there. <laughs> maybe. So we don't have comments. I'm still hassling youtube about it i don't know if it's gonna work but these live streams lets us have comments so yeah I, it's it's you know all this stuff i've tried everything you know i i know all the things about like kid friendly age limits and all that stuff we've tried everything it's uh it's a problem so okay Will she try to once she build? Okay, so I think that's that's a that's a little over ninety minutes now of our yeah. live stream, and it's starting to get dark outside, so we're gonna lose light. I think the camera still looks pretty good. Oh, by the way, I lost my microphone jack on my camera. By the way, so I'm having to use this external like contraption. I'll show you guys what it looks like. Maybe I can do this. Let me see what this looks like. I'm using this crazy contraption to have a camera, microphone, external adapter, all this stuff. But anyways, it's one thing after another. So now I got to figure out how to fix my camera's microphone jack. So it's going to be harder for me to make vlogs because I can't have a microphone on my main camera for vlogs anymore. So I have to have it set up on a tripod. But it's okay because we're stuck inside anyways and uh, I'm just gonna have this kind of live stream set up in this corner while we're here and then we'll do more live streams so I want to thank you guys for joining this live stream it was yeah, fun thank you yeah thanks to everybody who are new and thanks especially to everybody who have been with us for a long time I appreciate it thank you Holly I know that uh, you know, seems like I'm complaining a lot lately, but it's one thing after another. <laughs> Sound is really low, but okay. Well, okay. you know, we'll, we'll it's figure it out. Yeah, it's our first time using this setup, so you know, there's gonna be kinks we have to work out. So I'm gonna like play with the setting to get this to work right. But anyways, well that's it. Yeah, thank you everybody. It was nice chatting with all of you. We'll see you guys. Bye.